Vinnie Politan, who has the night off. Well, it was a very long day for jurors weighing the Bitch. evidence in the pizza delivery murder trial we're covering for you out of Akron, Ohio. That jury, made up of six men and six women, concluded a second day of deliberations. So far, they've deliberated for nine hours total and still no verdict. Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter has been our eyes and ears in the courtroom and filed this report for us once the jury went home for the night. I spoke to a friend of Ashley Biggs today, Michael Trim, who told me that as each hour ticks by for the deliberation, as he awaits for a verdict, he's not getting any nervous. What I hope is happening, what I hope is that there is somebody in that room that's fighting for, for Biggs. That's what I hope is happening. I hope that there is know however many jurors that are fighting for justice for for her and that aren't um, being disillusioned by um, Chad Cobb's wishy-washy statement and the length of time it took for him and his mother to come forward all things that just made this case worse um, all things that make it harder to, to say yes this lady is guilty you know and let's move forward to uh, you know a punitive stage so what I hope is happening is that there are jurors that are fighting for my friend the way that we fought for her the first time around he like many friends and family that I've spoken to of the victim Ashley Biggs wish they could have been here every single day of the trial over the last week and a half and usually at trials we see also a lot of the defendant huh? here Erica Stefanko on the line for her. Her life is at stake and the jury will resume deliberating whether or not she'll spend the rest of her life in prison tomorrow when they return here at 9 a.m. Eastern. And of course, Court TV will be here. I will be right outside the courtroom, the deliberation room for any word, any verdict from this jury. I'll send it back to you, Julie. Let's bring in our think tank now to discuss our special guest tonight in Tampa, Florida, State Attorney in Hillsborough County, Andrew Warren. We have from South Orange, New Jersey, media law professor and legal journalist Candace O'Kelly, and in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Daryl Cohen. Wonderful to see the three of you. Thank you so much for lending us your expertise tonight. Okay, so the first big question is the one on most people's minds. I think at least our Court TV viewers have been writing in on social media and whatnot. And that is, what is taking so long to come to a decision in this case? Candace, I'm going to begin with you and let you go first. What are your thoughts, please? You know, there are a lot of moving parts in this case. Not only do you have to figure out, okay, what happened on that night in terms of the timeline, but you have the timeline leading up to the murder. And then you also have you know, the familial aspect of it. I mean, at first, you had one married couple, and they were separated. You've got a mixture of kids, and some of them testified, and then you had remarriages, and somebody cheated on somebody's friend. So there's so much to figure out. I think that when we look at the timeline and all the moving parts, I think that that's really going to be at issue here. That's what the, uh, the jury is probably thinking about now, and that's going to be their task when they start tomorrow at 9 a.m. I think the other thing that uh, they are, they're thinking about is why um, Erica didn't take the stand. I think that that was peculiar. I think that it was best that she didn't take the stand, that the fact that at one point she know. was going to take it, then all of a sudden didn't, it made it seem like there was something wrong. And we just don't know what that is. So I think that that's what they're looking at. Andrew, I want to go to you next, please. Why do you think this jury is still deliberating? It's really hard to predict. Uh, trial lawyers have to sit around and try to figure out what's going on in the jury's mind. But the reality is that predicting jury deliberations is like reading tea leaves. You have no idea whether there's one juror who's holding out, or if there's one single issue that's causing them uh, delay. Or there are a couple people who are waiting for a piece of information on one particular issue. We just don't know. And the one thing you can be certain about when it comes to jury deliberations is you can't be certain about anything. So at this point, all you can do, if you're the prosecutor and the defense, is rely on the case that you presented and hope that the jury is following the instructions and doing their best to deliberate thoroughly. Well said. Daryl Cohen, last but certainly not least in the group, who shared your thoughts with us and why you think this jury is still out after nine hours. Julie, I think what we have is a murder soap opera, and that's exactly what you have to think about. No 
know, we can never predict why a jury is hanging up. They may have hung up. They may be hanging on a hangnail. There may be, as previously said, one person who is not happy and is not content yet to find them guilty or not guilty for that matter. You just don't know. And as I said it so correctly, you just don't know what's going on in the jury room. They pick out things that no one believes they could pick out. How did she look at me? Was she looking at me straight? Was she looking at me cross-eyed? Did she frown at me? Did she smile at me? Why is she smiling? You just don't know. And you do have to rely on what happened during the trial. And ultimately, they're going to come back in all likelihood with a verdict. If the defense has their way, it will be a hung jury, not a not guilty. If they can get it, but a hung jury, they love a not guilty, but they'll be happy with a jury that cannot come to a decision. Oh, certainly. That would be a win for the defense as well. Uh, Daryl, thank you. So I want to pick your brains now about a big piece of evidence that's very critical to the state's case, and that is that recording that Cindy Cobb, murderer Dad Cobb's mother, made of her and defendant Erica Stefanko talking. And in it, Erica Stefanko makes some admissions about making that fatal phone call for that pizza to Domino's. So I want to go back and play for you that recording that was played in court so we can take a listen to it, and then I want to get your thoughts on this event. I mean, I mean, I can hear you on that. I don't think you belong to where he is. No. If I did, if I did,
actually defend herself with her own words, and that's what they're left with now in that jury room, and, and it's not a good look. <clears throat> no, no, not at all, and um, I know many of us were hoping we would hear from her, but of course it's her right, her decision to testify, or not, she chose not to. Um, Daryl Cohen, I want to tap into your defense expertise, although you've been a prosecutor, I want um, you to take the defense position here with this recording. So we know she's not explicitly saying that she had this plan with Chad Cobb and the plan was to murder Ashley Big. She's just admitting to making this phone call and she's saying, yeah, Chad told me to do it. So how do you take that from a defense standpoint and refute the state of Ohio's argument here that she was an accomplice in this murder? I don't think you have to refute what the state of Ohio has to say. I think you have to poke holes in it. You have to make her not the bad person that she's made out to be. Yes, Candace pointed out that you can't see her face because of the mask. But what you can see is her body language. You can see her eyes. You can see how she's reflecting and reacting to everything that's said. You have to make her not the bad person. I made a phone call, but it had nothing to do with any murder. I wasn't in it with Chad. I just wasn't there. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. And if you could make one or two jurors believe that she is okay, that you shouldn't convict her, then they have succeeded. And quite frankly, it's a lot more difficult to have a man acquitted than it is female. We are still in an age where females aren't as bad as men, regardless of the charges, regardless of the facts. Just the way it is. Julie, can I, can I jump in and just say that we had the daughter say that she heard her make the phone call. That's a problem. Uh, you know, and then also when we look at it, but for this phone call, then Ashley would not have been at the scene behind this building to have been murdered. So just the other side of that is that we do have evidence that plays into other theories when we look at that in that way. And other theories, but what do you mean? Uh, explain. Well, not for... for well, for example, when we look at the other side of it and, and going against um, and going against Erica, uh, we have the phone call that was made. The daughter says that she heard Erica make that phone call, and but for the phone call, then Ashley wouldn't have to have gone to that to behind the building in order to be murdered. Okay, so I, I guess are you trying to make the point that but for that phone call, she wouldn't have been in that place? Is that well, well, but for the phone call, Ashley certainly wouldn't have been in that place in terms of the pizza. Okay, right, right. But that the key issue, though, is what was her criminal intent, if any, at the time making that phone call? Um, and, you know, Dara, I want to bring you in on this one. If she just was told by Chad, hey, make this call, I want to talk to her, I want to meet her, whatever, hash out this nasty custody dispute we're having, then Erica Stefanko had no idea he was going to beat her and strangle her like he did, um, not a crime to just make that phone call, right? Not if she did it unknowingly. Listen, he may have said to her, Nadia, why are you making me make this call? Nadia, none your business. <laughs> and maybe that is what she's trying to say. Remember, juries are not just looking at what they saw in the trial. They are not just listening to the evidence and watching the evidence. They're watching her very carefully, even when she doesn't know she's being watched. And as I view her, she has almost no emotion. And that's not good. I think from a defense point of view, she needs to have emotion. She needs to be fearful. She needs to be tense. But we'll see. The jury is going to do what the jury is going to do. And they are predictably unpredictable. Answer is right. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Predictably unpredictable. I love it. Uh, Daryl Cohen, thank you for those little words of wisdom there. And um, I think one of the best things the defense has going for them in this case is their star witness, Chad Cobb, his words that he did not make this plan with Erica to murder Ashley Biggs. So that's one of the other things that certainly has factored in, and who knows what this jury is thinking, and I understand what we have to do is leave the discussion there for now, because it's time for a break, and when we come back here on Court TV Live, we will bring you a preview of the sentencing.
in another case, another trial we brought to you here on Court TV Live, the jealous lover murder trial out of Florida and the office that prosecuted.